Lord Jesus, you said in Scripture, the words that I have given you, they are spirit and they are life. So Father, my prayer today is that you, Lord, will be spirit and life to us for your glory and for your name's sake. Amen. Can I begin just before we get to the message, can I really begin by in really encouraging you as much as I possibly can encourage you to invite people, bring people to next weekend for Malcolm McPherson. He's an evangelist and evangelists have a great gift of healing and different things like that and a real uh, gift of encouragement to the body as well. So if I can really encourage you to invite people, bring people, and come with that sense of expectation. Pray during the week, please pray. The, the Lord will draw people and that he will maybe even save people. But let's believe God for, for miracles and signs and wonders. So if I can really encourage you in, in that area, uh, first of all, to say really bring people uh, to hear the gospel as well and see what the Lord will do. Fill the empty seats, that's a, an encouragement. You know, we all desire the same thing, that God will move, but he won't move unless we move. Come on. He won't move unless we move, folks. Okay. <laughs> I'll be gentle. Um, I just wanted to share one more thing before we came to the message as well. During the praise time as well, you know, the, I was listening to the songs, I always listen um, and worship the songs, and sometimes you just hear the Holy Spirit whispering or saying something to you. And I was reflecting on the thing about being fearful, being fearful. And maybe there's areas of your life that have caused you fear, or maybe you're experiencing a fear or a concern right now. That fear comes from the enemy. It comes because he wants you not to trust in God. He wants to make you fearful, to make you feel inadequate and weak. And I really felt the Lord saying, take courage, take strength in the Lord. Take courage and strength in the Lord. Do not be fearful. How many times in Scripture there's a variant of do not fear? Over 356. More than that, actually. One for every day of the year, interestingly. So, do not fear. It says that throughout Scripture so many times. So we can take our, our confidence and trust in Scripture. And then there was, we were singing that song. You make the darkness tremble. You, you, your name cannot be overcome. And that's the truth, dear brothers and sisters, today. Jesus' name is above every name that can be named in heaven and on earth in his name and his word cannot will not be overcome so i really wanted to give you the sense of encouragement this morning uh, as we began the, the ministry time and see what the lord but please have that sense of expectation on my way here i had a real sense of expectation knowing that god is working and moving among us and my desire and my prayer is that that sense of expectation will grow among all of us. That when we come to a church on a Sunday, we'll come with, I wonder what God is going to do today. I wonder how God is going to move today. That was my prayer coming through this morning. And just that sense of expectation. And I want that expectation to grow among all of us today. And not just today, but every time we come, come with that sense, God... I'm going, I'm going to see you do something. I'm going to see something happening. So let's have that sense of expectation as we come, even today. So, let's get to the message today. <laughs> when, when I, I've been thinking a lot, you know, the Lord has been speaking a lot to us, particularly and specifically around the things that he wants to do, and where he wants to take us forward, and how he wants to take us forward. And we know that God is saying we're moving forward, we're moving into a new thing. The scripture says that, behold I am doing a new thing, the old, the old has gone, the new has come. And I, I was reflecting a lot because we've been hearing this, a very similar message for quite a while now. 
So I was thinking, as I was preparing, I was beginning to think and pray around this thing about, Lord, what is it that you're trying to... Because sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes there are times that we, we don't really fully understand all the things that God is saying, do we? No, we don't. And why is that? Because God wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. And that scripture says that we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we can only walk one step at a time as the Lord reveals to us what it is that he wants for us. But, so I was reflecting on all of that. And the title of my message is a very simple one word title. The word following. Following. The, the first steps that we take when we're following somebody are very, can I say, we don't know the whole picture. The Lord reveals to us one step at a time, as I've already just said. And especially when we're going somewhere we haven't been before. <laughs> Have any of you went to, a, I'm sure we've all went on a holiday, and I've done it myself a couple of times, I want to go on holiday somewhere different, somewhere that I haven't been before, somewhere maybe that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about, just for something different. Because we can, we can go to the same places, and we can become familiar, and we see the same things. And even in, our, even in church, we don't, you know, a similar thing could happen. We can come to the same place week by week and we can see the same people and sometimes we can even hear the same things because God is repeating a message but the thing is we can, we can become accustomed to that and when God starts speaking to us about something different sometimes it doesn't sit very well because we're creatures of habit we like things the way that they are and then when God starts stirring us up and saying, I've got something better for you. I've got something more for you. And when he begins to stir things up, we don't always like that. It makes us a little bit uncomfortable. So it's really important that when that's happening, that we pay attention to exactly what God is saying and how he wants to direct us. And especially when we're going somewhere where we haven't been before, or doing something that you haven't done before, you need to follow very carefully and closely. I have a sat-nav in my car, and I discovered that the sat-nav is good when you haven't been somewhere before, and you're traveling along the roads and you're not quite sure. But let me tell you about a sat-nav. Number one, it has to be kept updated. It has to be kept updated, because if you don't update it and the roads change or the new roadworks or, or put new roads in, you'll soon get lost. I remember when I was on holiday, I was going down this particular road when I was going um, somewhere for the day, a day trip, and every time I passed this stretch of the road, it said, turn left, <coughs> and I'm like, but there is no left turn, but then I realised Maybe there was once the left turn there, and it's all been changed. So my sat-nav wasn't completely up to date. So it's good as long as you keep it updated. It's also good as long as you follow the instructions when it is updated. Now what you said, what, what's the relevance of that? We need to keep updated with the Lord Jesus. We need to keep listening to what he's saying and make sure that we're hearing and listening to what he's saying. And more importantly, especially when we're going somewhere we've never been before, it's very, very important that we follow his instructions. If a sat nav is up to date, it'll give you really, really good instructions. It'll give you very precise, exact instructions. But it's up to you to then follow those instructions. You can pick the sat nav up, up and you can program it all and it'll tell you everything. But if you choose to ignore it, I can tell you that you will end up somewhere that you never planned or intended to be. And it's just exactly like that in the Christian life. 
<coughs> Please hear this. We think that we sometimes know better. Lord, I've been this well, I'm experienced, I've been a Christian for such a long time. I've been saved since 1982. I've been a Christian a long time. I'm familiar with the territory. I'm familiar until Jesus says, I'm taking you somewhere where you haven't been before. Then it becomes a little bit more uncertain and a little bit more <coughs> unsure. So I need to listen to the instruction and make sure that I follow. Now it's not a blind following. Please don't misunderstand. The Lord tells you to use your, your common sense, to use your sound mind. But he says to you, you need to be updated. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Update your mind. Update your life. I, I laughed when I, when I looked into the meaning of this uh, in the concordance. It's a, there's a term, terminology there that is used for computers and it's the word download. <laughs> download. <laughs> this is the modern translations of course nowadays. The word download, sometimes we need to download from heaven into your mind. We need to renew our mind to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So how do we renew our mind? We renew our mind by the word of God, most importantly. And it says when you do that, then you may be able to prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. God gives you instructions and directions, not because he wants you to get lost and lead you astray. He gives you directions and instructions because he wants you to know precisely and specifically where he is leading you and where he wants you to go. And what, not only that, but what he wants to do. Because it's a process, you don't just suddenly arrive at the destination. It's a process, it's a journey. Sometimes that journey takes a bit longer than others, depending on how far you're going. And in the, time, in the case of the nation of Israel, that, day, that journey took 40 years. And it didn't need to take that time as I've previously said, but let's not go there again, that's not my... Uh, subject this morning. I was thinking about this following in the sense of we're not following blindly but we're using our common sense. But here's the thing that I've also discovered. Following doesn't always make sense. I've got two examples of that that I thought about <coughs> this morning. Jesus' first miracle that we know about Jesus' first miracle turned water into wine. And Mary said, do whatever he tells you. Now we know that part of the story. But I want you to think about that for a minute. He said, take all the, 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 the big jars and fill them with water. And it says the servants, they just did what they were told. But they knew it was water. Now if I was to say to you, run out of wine and you know, fill the jars up with water, you'd go, That's not, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't, I don't understand that, I, 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 don't get, I don't get it. So it doesn't always follow that it naturally makes sense. Because we don't always know, Jesus doesn't always reveal what the end result is. All he says to us is, follow and trust me. Follow me and trust me. That's what Jesus says, he says, follow me and trust me. Because we don't know, but Jesus knows. <coughs> he had a plan to take that water and turn it to wine. To take something that was and make something better with it. Come on. To take something in our lives and do something better. Are you getting this yet? To take something that was old and make it new. To take something that was past and redeem it to himself. That's what Jesus, Jesus that we follow this morning. And then of course, Jesus, and when he calls the disciples, and he goes to Peter, and they've been fishing all night. They were fishermen by trade. Fishing and caught, not a thing. Not a thing. And here's Jesus comes to them, 
And Jesus says to them, cast, cast out the nets. Come on. They'd been working all night. They were fishermen. They knew. They knew their trade. They knew what they were about. They had lots of experience. Come on. And Jesus is saying, put out your nets. And I can imagine the fishermen, I can imagine them, Peter and James and John saying, Lord, they said, Lord, we've been fishing all night and never caught a thing. And it didn't make sense. Come on. But nevertheless, because you say so. See, sometimes Jesus will tell you to do something. <clears throat> and it might not make sense. But, but please understand. You might not know what Jesus is planning and what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. And suddenly we see when they cast out the nets because Jesus said so. Now I want you to catch this. Because there's a principle here. There's a real principle here. They cast out the nets. And of course, what did they say? They caught a, a, a shoal of fish so big. Come on, yeah. catch this this morning. They cast out the nets and caught a shoal so big that the nets were almost breaking. Come on. The nets were almost breaking. And he says, they could, there was so much, it was so much, not only were the nets almost breaking, but the boats were full and they were almost capsizing. Come on, I want you to know this morning that Jesus wants to do something more than just throw out the net. He wants to make the net so full, come on, that the, that the nets are breaking and the boats can't size it. Come on, that's a, pro, a, a, a prophetic vision for you this morning. The nets are going to be so big and so full that the nets are going to be full to bursting point and there's not going to be enough room in the boat and in the ship. To, to capture them all. We're going to need a bigger ship, folks. Amen. I'm saying to you prophetically this morning, we're going to need a bigger ship, for yes. folks. Amen. Come on. Yes. Because it's not just means, I'm telling you what God has already said, this is nothing new. But sometimes God gives us the vision and gives us the thing, the picture in a different way to try and stir us up, to make us, to help us to understand. But that's not my message completely this morning. Help the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus' first call, Jesus' first call is always, follow me. You see that in the Gospels all the time. Follow me. Leave behind what, what, you, what, what you have, what, where you've been. Leave behind your past. Leave behind all your experience, all the pain and hurt and difficulty. Leave it behind, because it's a burden, and all it's going to do is drag you down and slow you down. Come on. I'm preaching on this. Good message here as well. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Because that's what we'll do. If you hold on to the past and you hold on to the experience and the pain in the heart, all it will do is weigh you down and slow you down. Like we heard it before, sometimes we need to let that stuff go. We need to let that go. Now, I know it's not easy. Please hear my heart. I know it's not. I know that, that there's a journey to be made there. But here's the thing. Jesus is with us on that journey. He knows the pain. He knows what we've been through. But he heals. Isn't he? He's still that same healer. He's still the, the, the Lord of Isaiah 61. Anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To bind up the broken heart. He's the same Lord yesterday, today and forever. So sometimes we just need to let that stuff go. And here's the thing that I've discovered. The Lord, I remember the Lord speaking it to me. <laughs> I remember, I remember the Lord speaking it to me personally a, a while, a long time ago when I was going through some things and he kept on saying to me about the past he shared, me, he shared with me about the past behold I am doing a new thing the old has passed and the Lord really started speaking to me on that personally when I was going through some difficult times the Lord really started ministering into that area and he started saying to me things like Stephen, until that past is gone and dealt with, the new thing can't come. Now that might be very simple, but for me that was exactly what I needed to know. Because there was an element of me that was still holding on. If I can just explain, explain it a little bit. I've been in a church for 11 years, passing in a church. So it's heart and soul and life. 
is to pour everything into it. And when the Lord started making it clear that time was coming to an end, it was really difficult. It was difficult to let go, having invested energy and time and sweat and blood and tears and prayer and, and sewing into people's lives. It was hard to let it go. And the Lord said to me, until you let it go, the new thing cannot come. And sometimes we need to let go of the things of the past. We need to let them go completely and entirely so that the new thing can come. And maybe the challenge for all of us this morning is maybe we're still holding on to an element of the things of the past. Good as they might be, there was, please, please don't misunderstand. The blessings were good. There might have been good times. There might have been great times. But I want you to know that they're past times. Come on. They're past times. I think about revival. Uh, you know, I believe God for an end time revival with, all my, with every fibre of my being. I believe it, I've studied it, I pray for it, I'm expecting it. And I realised when I started studying on revival, because I wanted to know, I wanted to know what was it that brought the revival. And I studied it for a long time. And I'll tell you why I stopped studying it. <laughs> Very simply, because the Lord started speaking to me. He said to me, Stephen, those revivals were in the past. Those revivals were, were for specific situations and in specific circumstances for a specific season in time and history. And as great as the Welsh revival was, as great as all these Hebridean revivals, as great as they were, the past. And we sometimes we look to the past but God said to, then God said to me, that's not the way I'm going to do it. Because we look to the past to try to, to, to discover and learn how God might do something. Until God says, no, I'm not doing it that way. And I've got a, a, a perfect example, which is going to be my main scripture when I get there shortly. But every time you see Jesus speaking, the first thing he says is, Follow me. Forget your past. Forget your experience. Forget all that you have been. Forget all of that. Not that it's unimportant. They were all good things. But now I've got something better. I've got something more. I've got something greater for you. But you might not understand it straight away. Because it's a journey. And the Lord wants us to take that journey and follow him. He says, follow me. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. You don't need to, you don't need to turn there. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's what he said to the disciples. And if you can see it for us, follow me and I will make you what I need you to be. Who I need you to be. We don't always know what he needs us to be. Matthew chapter 8 verse 22. Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Was Jesus being unsympathetic and unfeeling? No. He was trying to get them to understand that principle that being dead was never going to change. Come on. The situation and the circumstances were never going to change. It was dead and that was it. He wasn't being unsympathetic. He wasn't being uncaring. He wanted them to understand this principle. You have to let the dead lie. You have to leave it alone and move beyond, move beyond the grief. Move beyond the sorrow. Move beyond all of that. And that's not easy because we're human and we have emotion. Of course we do. And it's not Jesus. He was trying to teach us a principle to help us to move forward. Because as long as we're, as long as we're in the place where things are, are death, or death, D-E-A-T-H, death, then we will never see the new thing that God wants to do. We will never follow him. But we will always stay at the graveside. But God says, no, you need to move beyond that point. That point. And then, of course, there's another example, Matthew the tax collector. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. 
Jesus would pass and he saw a man named Matthew sitting with a tax collector and he said to him, follow me. And there's a principle there too. The things that you were formerly. You see, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We're new creatures and new creations. It, said, it actually says the old has gone and the new has come. Matthew was no longer going to be a tax collector. And God is able to take the things that we wear and make us to be the people that he wants us and needs us to be. Come on, are you getting something here? Are you getting something? You, you like the answer? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> this one. Thank you. See, following it has to be a priority. It has to be a priority. We have to make a decision to follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. No turning back. No. It has to be a priority. It has to be a decision. I have chosen. I have decided. I'm going to follow Jesus and keep following him. Follow me and I will take you. I will take you to a place that you've never been before. I will take you from your past. From what you think you were meant to be. See, when we all grew up, when, when I was young, there were lots of things that I wanted to be. But thank the Lord that Jesus had a better plan for all of us. He has a better plan for all of us if, we will, if only we follow him. What we think that we want to be and make us look, and take us to the place where we are, what he made us to be. Where we are, what he made us to be. Follow me. And the one thing that you thought was important will change. Your priorities will change. Because you will begin to do that thing that Scripture says in Matthew. Seek first the kingdom. The priorities will change. And what you thought was truly important will, will fade away to unimportance. I was sharing with somebody this morning. I remember... You, some of you know my testimony, and I'm not going to go into it in depth. But I remember when I was facing the possibility of death through cancer. I remember that time significantly in my life. It was a time of real soul searching, a, 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 a time of real reflection. Because I was so busy with so many things, I was busy with work. I was busy with this, that, and the next thing. All the things that I thought were important. And when I was faced with that diagnosis, I reevaluated my priorities. The things that, that were unimportant soon fell away as I re examined my priorities and discovered the truth that God had a better plan and a better purpose for me than what I thought. See, nothing can change the state of death. Death is that, that's the end. Man is destined to, to live once month, uh, Hebrews 9, 27, I think it is. Man is destined to live once, then after that, the judgment. Once we're dead, that's it, time's up. And we cannot stay in a place of death, because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. And that's the challenge, because if we stay at a place of death, we will miss the life that God has for us. As I said, Jesus wasn't being insensitive. He was understanding that nothing could change the fact. And he will change you from where you are to what he wants you to be. He's the one, like we read, he's the one that transforms not only our mind, but he also transforms our life. I want you to take you to my main scripture, Joshua chapter 3. I want you to see this uh, a little bit in, in a little bit more detail. Joshua chapter 3. This is the following to a place. We're now going to look at the following to the place where we haven't been before. This is a, an example of it. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israel, Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan 
where the cart before crossing over. After three days, the officer went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way you to go, since you have never passed this way before. Now, that's just a little section um, from the scripture. I, I want you to just help, to help you. I've got three labels just to help you um, with this particular truth. Three things that you will see. Follow carefully is number one. Follow closely is number two. And follow completely is number three. That's the three things that I want you to, I'm going to draw your attention to. Follow carefully. Why? Because Joshua says to them, you're going somewhere and you've never been this way before. Follow carefully. When you're going somewhere, when the Lord is leading you somewhere new, it's definitely a place that you haven't been before. Otherwise it wouldn't be new, it would be familiar. <laughs> now that might make, that might make sense. Follow carefully, because there's always that moment when Jesus says, now is the time to follow. There is always a when moment as, as well as a, a, a now moment, if I can say it that way. See, when God spoke to Habakkuk, in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, he was told to write the vision down, because the vision wasn't for them, them and men. The vision that Habakkuk was given, he was told this vision is, an, is for an appointed time. Now this is important that we understand because there's a now word that God says now is the time to move. But we're also told, write it down because it's not quite for now. This is for a future time and that's what happened with Habakkuk. Write the vision down for it's an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. In other words, God is saying, this is a word that's not quite for now, but it will come to pass. You can guarantee, you can rest assured, this is the truth and this is the word, and it will be for it. So there are things that God says to us that are for the future. But we need to stay. We need to stay. We need to follow carefully so that we're able to distinguish, and that we're able to see all those things that God has been speaking to us. Why do you think we noted that they were noted down? Because some of them are now, and some of them are yet to come to pass. So that's why we take note. That's why we did all those declarations and wrote them down and gave gave everybody a copy. Because some of them are for now. Some of them are for are promises from God of what he is doing right now, but there are also promises that are for the future that will come to pass in his perfect time. And we need to understand so that we know how to follow, when to follow. Knowing how to follow and when to follow is just important that we understand that. <coughs> See, there's always a right time and a wrong time. Romans chapter 5 verse 6, for just at the right time, when we were still sinners. <laughs> we don't understand what the right time is or why. But just at the right time, God, God does everything in his perfect time. And he will say to us, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to be saved. God speaks specifically, directly in that kind of language so that we will know the time in which he wants us to do something. I was sharing with Hamish, Hamish and I were chatting and, and we were just making plans and thoughts and we were saying, and it was just the realisation that we needed to prepare for what God was going to do. And if we didn't prepare, we'd all be caught out and we wouldn't know how to, what to do or how to do it. So we started talking about what, what God is speaking to our hearts so that we could start making preparation Folks, there's going to come a time when the, when the fish are going to outnumber. Come on. When there'll be so much fish, you won't know what to do with them. So we've got to prepare. 
And God is being gracious thus far that he has given us time to prepare for what he's about, about to do. But who knows how much time he will give us. Because I believe that there will be a suddenly moment like that fish when Jesus will say, cast out the net. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit, Jesus moves. And suddenly the nets are full of capacity. And they go, help, help. They had, that's what they did. They called out to their fellow fishermen, help. Because they couldn't cope, they couldn't deal with it. And folks, it's better to be prepared than being unprepared. <laughs> than being totally caught out. And that, I'm sure that's what these fishermen were thinking. They were caught out. And the nets were almost filled to breaking. And the boats were full and almost capsizing. Folks, what were we going to do when the net breaks? The nets were almost breaking. And the, the, the boats were almost capsizing. Because there's so many people. We don't know what to do, how to do it. We need to prepare. That's a little um, head stop. <laughs> At just the right time. God's got a perfect time. Christ died for the ungodly. When we were utterly helpless. The message of the gospel, the message of salvation at the right time. See, people, one of the things that we realise, you know, I'd love everybody to respond to the gospel and receive Jesus as personal Lord and Saviour. But there's a right time for them to come. And one of the secrets of that is sometimes they have to come to the end of themselves. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. We all have to come to the end of ourselves. When we've, we have no other solution, we've got no other answer other than turning to Jesus. And sometimes the Lord has to let people go to that level where they've got no other option but Jesus. And that's sometimes the truth. At just the right time, he knows the time. And of course there's a time, Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Let us not grow weary in doing good while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, I need you to hear this. Hear this carefully. There's a carefulness in this. We, it's easy to lose heart. Lord, why are, you taking, why are you taking so long? Why are you taking my time? Why are you taking your time and doing this at the next time? Because he's gracious. He's so gracious. It says, you know this, Scripture says that he is long-suffering. He will take whatever it takes to save that person. He will do whatever it takes to reach that person. And to us, we might begin to, to lose heart because it seems like it's taken, it seems like it's taken a while. But we don't know what God is doing or why he's doing it. But we do understand and know mm -hmm. that there's always a reason, there's always a purpose, mm -hmm. and there's always a right time. And what is the right time when God says it is? <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I'll tell you a little funny thing um, very quickly. I remember when I was reading that scripture in the New Testament, Behold I am coming soon. I was reading that particular verse one day, and I was, I, just, I was just caught up in it, and I was reading it, and I was meditating, and I thought, what does that mean? What does it mean? Because we all want to know, Lord, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming soon, yeah, but when? Because that's the human nature of us, isn't it? When, Lord, when? Come on, let's be honest, we're all like that. When? When is this going to happen? Soon. So I went up and looked, I looked up the biblical word for soon. <coughs> Not the, the, the actual meaning of not the, the, the word. And here's what it said an unknown period of time. <laughs> and, uh, soon, an unknown period of time. And like you, I laughed because I thought, well, that's, that's, that serves me right. But I also saw the humor of it an unknown period. Because the word says, there's things that you don't need to know. It's for me to know the times and the seasons set by my hand. So follow carefully. Secondly, let me move on very quickly because I'm nearly out of time. Follow closely. Follow closely. So we follow carefully because we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention and listen 
to what it is that God is saying. We need to follow closely to make sure that we don't miss what God is saying and what, how he's saying to do it. He's, that he might give specific direction and instruction and that we might follow it to the letter, what he tells us to do. Do what he tells you, exactly what he tells you. Nothing less, nothing more. But that means that you need to follow closely and pay close attention to what he is saying and doing. Acts chapter 1 is a good example. Verse 6. This is the apostles and the disciples coming to get together. When they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel to Israel? Now watch what Jesus says. He says, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. <laughs> they wanted to know something. But Jesus was effectively saying, you're asking the wrong question and I'm not going to give you the answer. He wasn't being awkward. But watch what he does say. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in J Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They were so busy fixated on what God was about to do or what God had promised that he would do. They were looking for the promises from the Old Testament to be fulfilled and they were expecting, Lord, is this what you're going to do? The, the, the whole focus was, was on what was going to happen in the nation of Israel. And Jesus says to them, in no uh, uncertain terms, it's not for you to know. Mind your own business. <laughs> Mind your own business. This is the Father has set things. It's great to see God's people coming back and making Aliyah to Israel. Because he has a plan and a purpose and he has a time. Israel is one of God's timepieces. So you watch Israel because it's a timepiece. It's a, it's a, a new hallmark of what God is doing. There's lots, believe me, I can teach that stuff to the cows come home. Literally. <laughs> it may be so. Because there's so much good teaching in there. But it, but it's easy to, to get distracted by that. And that's what, the, that's what the disciples were doing. They were asking him a question, they were asking the wrong question. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know. You don't need to know this now. But you will receive power. And that's the thing we can see. We can be so caught up in all the things that's going on around us. What will we do? How will we do it? Jesus says, none of that's important. It's not as important as you think it is, if I can say it that way. What's the important thing? That you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. For us, dear brother and sister, all these things, they, they might be important, but they're not as important as the things of God are receiving the Spirit of God. And that's the thing that, that, that I want to emphasize. That's what the disciples were doing. They had their focus on the wrong thing. And Jesus said to them, this is more important that you receive the power. The power that will make you witnesses. The power that will enable you to do what I need you to do. The power that will take you all over the earth and make this gospel known. That was what Jesus was trying to emphasize. They wanted to know what was next. <clears throat> Jesus says to them, no. The priority was wrong because Jesus was saying to them, I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to receive the callings and giftings. They're vitally important. And this scripture tells us that there is a divine mandate that is bigger and greater than what we think. The mandate to every Christian, Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, go into all the world and make disciples. There is no greater priority, no greater higher mandate than, than souls for the kingdom, according to the Gospel of Matthew. They had to follow closely to find out and ensure that they were following his leading. That's just the second one. Isaiah 30, 21. You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, follow it, whether, whether it turns to the left or the right. When you're going us for walking somewhere you've never been before, you want to make sure that you're close to Jesus, close enough to hear his voice speaking to you. And in good enough time that you can respond to that voice telling you this is the way walk in it. Number three, very quickly, follow completely. 
Follow completely, not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. The scripture says in Luke, in the Gospel, no one who puts their hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 62. We need to follow wholeheartedly. As God has been telling us so completely, um, obviously, and completely, I don't even know the word I'm looking for, overwhelmingly making it known. The one thing that he's been saying to us, uh, for beyond all doubt, is I need every one of you to put your hands to the plough. I need every one of you. It's not about one person, it's about all of us. Now, we, I don't need to repeat those messages because you've heard them. But that's the truth. That's about following wholeheartedly. That's about following wholeheartedly. We heard it today. The message about empty chairs. God doesn't want empty chairs. <laughs> I'll tell you another little funny thing that I used to do. In our, in our building back over in Dundee, every week I would go and I would pray over the chair and say, Lord, fill that chair with somebody. Because I knew that that was God's desire. But then I went one step further, and it wasn't, I was, it wasn't, I'll, I'll be funny, but I'm just telling you what, like, this is what I did. So I started speaking to the chair, and I started saying to the chair, you're going to be full in Jesus' name. And I believed that there was a time that God did that. But then God said to, I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me one time, don't just speak to the chair, give the chair a name. <laughs> Give the chair a name. Now there's a, there's a humour in there. John, Colin, David, Margaret, Sophia, June. <laughs> now we don't need to know specific names. But the point was the Lord was telling me to stretch my faith and to believe for people. Because it's easy to look at a chair and see an empty chair. But God was saying, stretch your faith and start calling the people in. Amen. Call the people in. Yeah. Or, or even better, bring them in. <laughs> Come on. Don't so just call them in, bring them in. There's a challenge for you. I said it for next week. Bring people with you to hear the sound of, to come on to the sound of the gospel. Now, I very quickly want to very quickly close off with this, with Joshua. So Joshua comes, in Joshua, they come to a point, we've read it already, already. they come to a point, in uh, verse 13, of where we were, and as soon as the priests carry the ark of the Lord, of the ark, they set foot in the Jordan, and its waters were flowing downstream, will be cut off and stand up in the heat, so when the people broke up camp and keep to cross the Jordan, the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was in full flood at that stage of the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests were carrying the Ark, the Jordan reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. At a time called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan and goes on. So the people crossed the, the opposite, crossed over opposite Jericho. Verse 17, the priests who carried the ark stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by. The whole nation had completely crossed over on dry ground. The point I wanted to share in that scripture was when did the miracle happen? And here's the principle that I'm trying to get to close off here. The miracle happened the instant that they put their foot onto the land that they were to go into. The, the water stopped. It says as soon as their foot stepped out, the water upstream completely stopped. But not until and this is the point. We're looking for miracles and signs and wonders. But when will they happen? When we take the step of faith that God is telling us to speak to take. 
when we follow the way that Jesus is telling us to follow, that's when we will see. But it will not happen until we take that step. It's like the new thing. The new thing cannot take place, will not take place, until the old thing has passed. But we also have to let it pass. And we have to step out. We have to follow. That's about trusting Jesus. That's about trusting the Lord. We have to follow. To see that happening, we need to follow completely and wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. We need to follow absolutely. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your, with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Why is that important, dear brother and sister? Because the truth is, if we try to lean on our own understanding, we will never see it. Because the steps that Jesus is telling us to take are steps of faith. Faith is the substance of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. He's telling us to take steps of faith. That's hard. In all your ways acknowledge you, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. We don't need to worry about following him because he says, I will make it clear, I will make it plain, I will make it straight. John 14, 1, we know this scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, also believe in me. That word that's translated troubled can also be translated as trust. When we follow somebody, we have to trust. Jesus is saying, follow me and trust me. And of course, there's this famous thing that I, I was reading, and I'll close with this scripture, Matthew chapter 19, 25. The disciples were having a discussion with Jesus, and Jesus was telling them, you'll see this happens every now and again. Jesus teaches them something that's hard. There was an instance in Jesus' ministry where Jesus was teaching something that was really difficult to understand. And it says, from that point, many turned away and stopped following him. So there were times when Jesus said something that people didn't understand and just ended up leaving and going away. So it's about trust. And, the, and when the, this discussion was taking place again in Matthew 19, the disciples say, said, when, when, when the disciples heard this, they were astonished saying, who then can be saved? Because Jesus had said to them something that was very difficult for them. And what did Jesus say? With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, when you are following, you might not know where it leads, but we trust the one who is leading us. I like that. One of my favourite songs is, I know, I know, he holds the future. Because he lives, I can face the Lord. I like that song, and I remember sharing it with my sister, and I've shared it lots of times. I might not know what the future holds, but I know him who holds my future. I might not know where the path leads, but I trust him in whom I follow. I'm trusting the one I follow. I might not know where the, where the path leads, but I'm following him because he says he will direct and lead me. And when you are following God, the things that you thought were impossible suddenly become possible. Because scripture says, with God. There's the key, that word, with. With God, all things are possible. When we follow closely, carefully, wholeheartedly, completely, that was a tough CD, I forgot. Carefully, closely, com and completely. Carefully, closely, completely. When we follow in that way, Jesus will make sure that he is guiding us. And he, like we've already heard countless times, he says, never, never, ever, ever. That's the emphasis, by the way. I don't know if you know that. It doesn't just say never, ever. It doesn't say just never. The connotation is never, ever, ever. Ever, ever, times infinity will I leave you or forsake you. That's the promise of Jesus. And he says, when you follow me, I'm with you. Not only are you with me, 
come with you. Amen. Let's close. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your work and help us to follow you carefully, closely, and completely. Help us to follow you every step of the path. Where you lead us, I will follow, we will follow. And Father, we desire that, that you will have your way, that your kingdom will come, your will be done, and your plans and purposes towards us will be unfolded in Jesus' name. Amen.